have talked about the five pieces of evolution, and we've discussed some basic trends in hominid evolution. So now we're going to take a look at part two, so the second half of our unit eight. How does evolution happen? And we're going to talk about this in terms of natural selection and genetic drift and gene flow and how mutation and genetic recombination can actually increase genetic variation. So this is going to take place in our next couple videos. So before Darwin created his theory of natural selection um, or the theory of evolution, there were ways of thinking that wasn't quite like his. So before he created this theory or his evidence to create this theory, it was thought that all species are fixed and do not change. And it was also determined that Earth was around 10,000 years old. And at the time, most, well, not all people, but um, the, the theory that the world was flat was um, prevalent in the society, along with a lot of other ideas. So there wasn't a whole lot of thought that, that organisms can change over time. So what helped shape Darwin's thinking about natural selection? Well, definitely his voyage um, to the Galapagos Islands was one of those on the HMS Beagle that actually helped shape his whole theory of natural selection um, and evolution. But we do have to consider some of the other scientists that came before him. So some theory uh, or some theorists, some other scientists before Darwin came up with some of their own hypotheses. And one of them was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He was a French naturalist, naturalist who proposed a hypothesis around 1809. So this was a few years before Darwin came about. Now Lamarck thought that organisms can change during their lifetime by selectively using or not using various parts of their bodies. He called this acquired characteristics or the theory of acquired characteristics. And the thought was that these acquired characteristics during an organism's lifetime can be passed on to their offspring. So it's kind of thought if you think of this in terms of a giraffe, a giraffe who can't reach the top tree or the top of a very tall tree stretches and stretches and stretches their neck until they can actually reach it. And that characteristic of a long neck will then be passed on to an offspring. We know now that Lamarck's hypothesis is actually proven incorrect because logistically it cannot work. So a little bit more graphic, um, a little scenario here. Imagine that a person was in a car accident and had to have a leg amputated. Well, and that person were to then to have children after that, it doesn't mean that the offspring of that person is going to then have only one leg. Features gained during life cannot be passed on to children. Now, there are some situations such as um, mutated DNA, that which could perhaps change some genes, which could affect some of those phenotypes. However, the features themselves, such as this example of a leg amputation, or uh, the giraffe stretching their neck to reach the top, of, the top of the tree, those cannot be. So Lamarck's theory of acquired characteristics is not a possibility, but it was one of those um, possible theories that helped Darwin shape his theory. So as I mentioned earlier, Darwin studied plant and animal life in South America during his trip on the HMS Beagle. And he visited the Galapagos Islands and he did a lot of work with the finches on this island. He noticed that the animals were very similar to the species on the mainland of South America, but um, this particular island also had a very unique ecosystem and some of those species that were there had very unique adaptations for the lifestyles or the foods or the for the um, environment on those particular islands. So as he was describing these and studying these organisms, he described the process of change as natural selection. So this he described as the process by which organisms with variations most suited to their local environment survive and leave more offspring. 
And these beneficial variations are called adaptations. So any heritable characteristic that increases an organism's ability to survive and reproduce in the environment is going to be ex exceptionally um, beneficial to that organism. So differences in adaptations affect an individual's fitness, which is how well an organism can survive and reproduce in its environment. So all of these parts of natural selection helped shape his new theory into something that we know today. So it's not that one organism suddenly changes into another. It really is about the process of adapting to a new environment. Those that have higher fitness, meaning those that are able to survive and reproduce, are then able to leave more offspring, which is how those traits survive in a population. Now, as I kind of just mentioned, within a population of animals, plants, or any organisms, there's going to be inherited variations. And within each species, those individuals that have the variations best suited to the environment will actually survive better, will then be able to reproduce, and when they reproduce, they're going to pass on that genetic information to their offspring. And in that genetic information, we'll have those traits those phenotypes that will be able to help that organism survive. So due to the adaptations, this is how species actually evolve. So again, it's not that they change directly from one day to another. It sometimes is a very gradual change. Sometimes it is a quick change only due to the adaptation that's needed in the environment. So over time, a population can change so much that it may even become a new species. It won't be able to reproduce successfully with the previous species. And this is something called speciation. So this is where a new species comes about in a population. Now with Darwin's work, we actually came up with a lot, or he came up with three different scenarios in which natural selection will occur. So natural selection will occur in any situation in which more individuals are born than can survive. This is known as the struggle for existence. Now in this case, for instance, we have lots of fish, um, fish eggs being delivered. So when a fish will um, lay eggs, it lays hundreds and hundreds of eggs and hope that they get fertilized. Now, not all of those will A, get fertilized, or B, make it to adulthood. So a lot more eggs are actually produced and fertilized than will actually reach adulthood to pass on their genes. Now, also we have to consider the turtles on our Florida beaches. So we see all these cute little turtles struggling to get out to the sea, but in some instances, um, those turtles will not make it. So they fight against uh, predators along the beach. They fight trying to get into the ocean. Um, and then, of course, they just have to try to grow to adulthood. So a lot more individuals are born than can actually survive. Natural selection occurs in any situation in which natural hereditable variation affects the ability to survive and reproduce. So variation and adaptation is very important in, in populations. So those that are better adapted to an environment will, will be able to survive and reproduce. Also, natural selection occurs in any situation in which fitness varies among individuals. And this is differential reproductive success. So again, this goes back to the fittest can survive. Those ones that, have, that, that are able to survive and then reproduce will then carry on those successful traits. Now, these three works were actually developed into Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. Now, it is interesting to note, however, there was some other scientists, including Alfred Wallace, who was directing the thought of natural selection or evolution by natural selection. Charles Darwin was just the first one to publish. So it's with Darwin's work and, of course, Wallace's work that we can carry on with traditional DNA work now, and we can then carry forward some of the elements of evolution by natural selection. And this is what you are going to learn next. That there's key elements, seven key elements to Darwin's theory. 
So some of these we've already kind of discussed, but they kind of expand on those three that we just saw in Darwin's original work. So the first one is that there's more offspring that will be produced than can survive. And in all honesty, food is going to be a limiting factor in this as well as um, predators and of course adaptations. Number two, there's natural variation in the species. And this is good. We want to see a lot of variation within species. Otherwise, it's the same DNA being passed down and they might not weather any sort of major storms, such as um, a bottleneck effect, which we'll talk about later, or disease. Also, a third one is constant competition among individuals for, survi for survival. So there's obviously lots of competition for reproduction, for food, comp uh, competition for shelter. So con <laughs> competition is something that continues forward as well. A fourth key element of Darwin's theory is that individuals with favorable traits are more likely to survive and reproduce, those ones that are able to adapt to the environment. A fifth element, the environment determines which traits are favorable. I can't say that, um, oh, my brown hair is a favorable trait, if it really isn't. So really, in the case of an environment, it really is the environment that determines those traits that are favorable. So for instance, in the pictures here, we have two different lizards. Do you think that either one of these could survive in each other's habitats? So if we take a look at the one on the left, which is looking a little bit more desert-like, able to withstand dry temp, uh, some dry environments, probably high temperatures, whereas the one on the right looks like it lives in very lush, wet environments because it's green. I see lots of greenery around. So do you think they can survive in each other's habitats? Jot down your answer real quick in your notes. A sixth key element of Darwin's theory is that favorable traits are passed on to offspring at a higher rate than non-favorable traits. And this increases the frequency through time, which possibly could produce new species. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about peppered, peppered moths in class, but during the Industrial Revolution, there were times where this darker moth here, the one on the right-hand side, this one was actually a little bit more favorable because of the soot and all of the pollution type of products that happen to be on the sides of trees, on the sides of buildings, because it can blend in a little bit more. This one on the left, which looked a little bit lighter, this particular one was not able to survive as much because it was being picked off by predators. It couldn't camouflage itself well enough in the darker trees and the darker buildings. The seventh and final key element of Darwin's theory is that geographical isolation may also lead to the formation of new species. So we do see this on the Galapagos Islands, and one of the things that he noticed, Darwin noticed, was that these, these species of finches looked pretty similar to the mainland finches, except that they had specific adaptations for the actual environment, perhaps for food. Uh, food gathering was a big one. And so all of these beaks that we see here are very specific to the type of food items that these finches eat. So at some time, uh, these, the mainland birds flew over to the Galapagos Islands, they settled down, and they in turn adapted so well to those islands that they were never able to then reproduce with mainland South America, or the, the mainland finches. So in other words, they basically became new species over time because they adapted to the environment.